This morning we're going to look at verses 12 through 14. So let me read those verses for us. Please follow along with me in your Bibles if you would. The Apostle Paul continues by writing, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. For unto the law sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. Okay, We're going to look at these verses this morning, try to, by God's grace, gain an understanding of what Paul's not only saying in these three verses, but continuing to set the stage for the truth that he's building, because the, the truth does not end here. It, it continues on, obviously, with the things that are going to be said to move forward. But we have a very important truth this morning, and one that uh, I would just say we're going to have to give our, our attention to this morning to understand, uh, not because, um, really in one sense, because it's that difficult, but because of the way... Paul writes it and his logic, we have to think, we have to think along the way he's thinking and the way he's presenting the information. And with that, so that's going to require us to try to engage in his thought process so we can follow his reasoning and by that deduce the truth that under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit he's giving to us here. And it is important truth. So I pray the Lord will help us to do that. Let's go to the Father in prayer before we begin and ask his help. Father, this morning we ask that you would help this portion of our service here to be a blessing and help to us. Lord, I do believe that the truth that is before us here is uh, important truth. And uh, Lord, uh, I believe that uh, you had your servant, the Apostle Paul, write it uh, specifically in the fashion in which he uh, needed to so that we can understand this truth. And Father, hopefully we'll be able to see briefly this morning, but uh, flesh out in much greater detail in the weeks to come. This truth is so important, not as much because of what it says about Adam, as we'll look at this morning, but because of what it intends to help us understand about Christ going forward. So, Lord, in that sense, it is so imperative that we understand fully what is being taught. So, Lord, please, uh, may your spirit have free course in our hearts and minds. We have a job to do. We have to listen. We have to give ourselves. We have to engage our minds. We have to be willing to think. So, Lord, we... This morning, hopefully, we'll all pledge to do that part. But Lord, we ask that you would do the part that only you can. And your spirit alone can do it. That is to impart this truth to us in a spiritual way that it can actually impact our lives, change us as your people, sanctify us, and set us apart through your truth. That's our prayer for this hour. So, Lord, use this time for your glory and our benefit. We pray and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't know if I gave the title. Uh, before praying, but I've entitled the message this morning, Adam, our federal head. Adam, our federal head. And if you're with us last week, I, I presented a preparatory message, that's the way I, I uh, at least attempted to preach it, to set the stage for this opening session, section of Scripture that we're uh, beginning today in earnest. And I stated that these verses that are before us are, are really foundational, they're fundamental, they are key biblical doctrines that every Christian needs to get a good grasp of and understand. And I said within these verses that we're going to be looking at over these next few weeks, there are at least three very important truths that are clearly brought before us and that we are asked to accept and understand. One of those is the validation of the biblical record of the literal Adam, that Adam truly was a literal human being. And when we consider what we'll even talk about in these three verses this morning, we're going to be forced to answer within our hearts whether or not Adam is a literal man, that he actually existed, and that he was the first human that God ever created. Now, just trying to say this honestly and openly, we all have to come to a decision what we believe about that, so that rests with us. But I would say this morning, our text is going to remind us that scripturally, this question is not up for debate. The Bible in nowhere ever presents Adam as mythical or as just some force that we are to think about in broader terms. No, Adam is spoken to us as a literal man, and we're going to see that clearly this morning. And the Bible says you need to accept the record that God gives concerning this man. We are also in our section going to begin to understand and, and see brought before our, our minds and hearts the concept of that's called or typically called original sin. And in that term is wrapped up the idea of looking at the origin and the universal ramifications of sin in this world. 
theologians have called it original sin. And the doctrine of original sin regards the guilt of Adam's first sin, the subsequent lack of original righteousness that comes as a, as a result of this, the corruption that it brings upon the whole of human nature, together with all the actual transgressions that we uh, that proceed from it, those actual sins that we commit because of the reality of this original sin that began in this one man named Adam. A third truth that's going to be brought in our text this morning is very key and is really Paul's main thrust in this section is the idea of imputation. It is the idea that God reckons, and in this case, we'll see this morning, he reckons concerning the disobedience of one man. Later we'll read and understand that he also is reckoning on the obedience of one individual. And through these actions of the federal heads, this doctrine of the imputation then gives to us the reckoning or the outcome of their either disobedience or obedience. We're going to see that fleshed out before us in our text this morning in the, in the verses that we'll look in the coming weeks. Now, as I said at the beginning before we prayed, if we are going to understand this important teaching, we are going to have to consider it very, very carefully. It is going to prove imperative for us to do so if we're going to understand what has been written and the ramifications of what Paul is writing here. Now, as we begin thinking about these verses this morning, we need to really ask this question. Where did sin come from? And why is sin a problem? Where did sin come from? And why is sin a problem? And I want to look at the last half of that question first, and that is, why is sin a problem? Well, in short, I think the Bible here, and certainly our text this morning, would tell us it's a problem because sin brings forth death. Look at verse 12 again of our text. It says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sin. Our text informs us that death, comes by or through or from sin. And it, inform, it more fully informs us in this particular verse that this death has passed upon every man, every individual. Now, when we think about death in the biblical sense, as it's written and described in the scriptures, we realize that there is in death both a spiritual and a physical component, all right? But when we think about the term death, it refers far more to the fact that, that human beings are dying physically in this particular case. That's the way, in the way we typically think about it. But the Bible shows us that death impacts man in more than just a physical way. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5 state this. Paul writing to the Ephesian church says, And you hath he quickened, and that phrase was supplied by our, our King James translators. I mean, if you look at that in your Bibles, we're not turning there, obviously, but they're written in italics. They weren't verses that are there in the Greek. They're supplied. They actually come up later in the truth or later on. You could actually read it this. And you were dead, Paul writes the Ephesians, in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us, or made us alive together with Christ, by grace ye are saved. When we think about that statement that Paul writes to the Ephesian church, we realize that he is clearly writing this to people who are physically alive. Okay, They're not dead. In our sense of thinking of death as a physical sense, they're alive. That's how he's able to write to them. But he's describing them as individuals who were dead in trespasses and sins. So I think from this, we see clearly that when the Bible speaks of death with respect to human beings, it can refer to physical death, all right, the mortal body ceasing to be alive. When our heart stops beating, we take that last breath and our, our bodies die. We're separated from the soul of man. But it can also refer to death in the scriptures, to spiritual death. And in essence, we would think of spiritual death as that consequence of being cut off from God. God, who is life, we have been separated from him. And so in that sense, spiritually, we have died. Now, both physical and spiritual death are the consequence of sin. But while all of humanity is spiritually dead in their sins, 
physical death as a result of those sins, while imminent, is often delayed. And we're all examples of that, right? We may have may either have been or, or currently are dead in our trespasses and sins, but we're all very much alive physically as we see each other talking and breathing and moving about and doing our things. And the Bible would describe those who are at least outside of Christ as being dead. So there is a spiritual component to it. There is a physical component to it. They're both brought to pass by sin. Sin is what causes both of these things to happen, all right? So when we answer the question, the second part of our question, what is the problem with sin? Sin is a problem because it brings forth death. And while Paul has in mind the totality of death when he's writing in our text here, you know, being both physical and spiritual, we're going to see that he's going to use actual physical death as a way of illustrating and supporting his teaching here. All right? So the problem of sin is sin brings forth death. It separates men from God. It also causes us to physically expire, to pass away. Now, let's turn our attention to the first question, part of that question, and that is this. Where did sin come from? Where did sin come from? And I think, really, if we were to ask ourselves and think about this, this is a far more important question. But even though it's a more important question, its importance lies in the fact of the consequences of sin. If it could be shown that sin exists, but sin didn't have any consequence, then who would really care whether sin existed or not? But the fact that sin does have consequences, both physical and spiritual consequences, and given the fact that those consequences are universal, in fact, and they impact every human being, well, then that makes the question, where did sin come from, very very important. Paul states quite emphatically in our text where sin comes from. Again, back in verse 12, he says, wherefore as by one man sin entered into the world. Now in verse 12, Paul does not clearly identify who this one man is, but as he further elaborates in his teaching into verse 14 that we'll look at later in our text, he clearly does tell us who that one man is. He says, nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression. So we clearly see that when Paul says, sin entered into the world through one man, the man that he has in mind is this man named Adam. Okay, well then, who is Adam? Who is this individual that Paul is talking about here? Well, the very word Adam, the name Adam, comes from a Hebrew term used to describe the redness of the earth. And it seems to be used of Adam because we know that God sculpted Adam's physical body out of the very dirt of the ground. When you read the Hebrew Old Testament, you find this word used interchangeably in the scriptures. Sometimes it's used to describe the literal man, Adam. Other times that same word is used to describe mankind or humanity in general. In this case, it could be speaking both of males or females. The context is obviously going to be important when you're reading the scriptures to find out how is this word actually being used. Is he talking about a literal one person named Adam, or is he using the word Adam to represent the entirety of the human race? I want to spend a few moments this morning because I think this is key in setting the stage for what Paul says here to go back into Genesis and look at some of these creation account narratives and so we are, that we are all on the same page. And I, I don't mean to insult our intelligence. I know many of us are, are, are more mature in our faith. We understand these concepts already. But really, one, we need to be reviewing these things so we get the point of Paul's teaching. But that we also have to understand there are sometimes people who have never really come to put all of these pieces of the puzzle together. And if we just go on assuming that everybody understands and skip over these things, Some people may be lost in the process and never really understand the truth that God has for them here. So it is important for us to go back to these foundational scriptures and make sure we clearly all are on the same page. So let's turn our Bibles back to Genesis chapter 1, and let's look at the Bible's description here of the creation of mankind. Genesis chapter 1. And let me read verses 26 and 27 for us. We read here, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. All right. Now here we have the Bible's declaration concerning God's creation of humanity in general 
through the first creation, that first couple, Adam, and a woman later will come to find out whose name, name is Eve. Both, we find out from this text here, are created in God's image or likeness. So that's always important. And I emphasize this in many places elsewhere as we try to understand biblical truth, because while God distinguishes between the man and the woman, and we'll see even one of those here in Genesis in a, in a few moments, and they are separate entities made, in a sense, uh, distinct from one another and have distinct purposes, this first statement concerning humanity's creation always informs us of an vital and important truth. While they may be distinct in certain ways, they are unified in the sense that they are both created in God's image or likeness. So both males, in this case typified by Adam, and females typified by Eve, and all the subsequent men and women who are born from them are both created in God's image. They both are the imago Dei. They both give forth the image of God. They're equal in that particular sense. And they also are equal in the sense that both of them were given dominion over the rest of creation. So when God created man and woman, when he created mankind as the pinnacle of his creation, he then entrusted to them the responsibility of ruling over the rest of his creation. So, and that's not just the man's job, it is also the woman's job. Both man and woman have been given dominion over the rest of creation by the creator himself, all right? Now let's skip ahead to Genesis chapter 2 and read some more information that we find out as, as God unveils more for us. Let's begin reading in verses 7 through 9 of Genesis chapter 2, and it says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. And breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also is in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We're going to skip over some of this description about the, the, the area of the garden here in which he places man. And move on to verse 15 and pick up there, and it says, And the Lord God took the man, put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Now, I know we haven't read on further to see this, but we'll confirm this later. Here, this is... this restatement of creation is speaking specifically of God's creation of just the man, just Adam, the, the physical person himself. And we find from reading these verses that God formed Adam's body out of the dust of the earth. And after he had formed him and given him shape and form out of the dust of the earth, God then breathed into Adam's nostrils himself the breath of life. And we are told that when God did this to Adam, Adam was made alive. He became a living soul. We are also informed of the environment into which God at this time placed just the man, Adam, all right? And he called this, the, this place the Garden of Eden. And as you read even this brief description of it, we come to understand that it is a lush, I think we can possibly characterize it as a utopian environment in which we are told here that God planted every tree Adam could ever desire uh, with regard to his food choices, we are told that there is this great river that flows out of the midst of the garden and then breaks off into other branches of rivers and flows through the rest of the earth. So he certainly has plenty of drink to meet his needs and an incredible opportunity to serve God as God gives him specifically the task of dressing and keeping this utopian garden that God has placed him within. We are also informed in this passage that in the midst of the garden, God places a special tree. A tree described as the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And we are told that after he describes this to Adam, and we are told of its existence here, that he forbids Adam from eating of this tree. And he warns Adam clearly that if he disobeys this commandment, it will bring forth certain death. Okay? So as we continue to follow the, the creation narrative, we realize, yes, God created humanity in general. They're equal in the Imago Dei. They're equal in dominion over the earth. But now God's going to tell us, give us a little more insight into the creation process. And he tells us that first and foremost, God himself creates the man. He, he 
takes the dirt into the ground. He forms it into his body. He breathes life into him. He places him within this incredible Garden of Eden. He, he gives him everything that he'll need to survive and thrive, but he places within it also a tree, a tree that he forbids him to eat upon. And he says clearly to the man, if you eat this, you're going to die. Now let's move forward and pick up in verse 18 and read some of the rest of this creation account. And the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. And out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found and help meet for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and they were not shamed. Here we are given additional information about the special creation of the woman, the woman we call Eve. Eve, we are informed, was created from a portion of the man. A, here it's described in our King James Bibles as taking a rib. It just seems to be he takes a portion of the side of Adam, and God from that fashions the woman and, and makes her uh, a completer for Adam and brings her unto Adam. Adam receives the woman and takes her to be his wife. We are also informed through the commandment that God gives to this couple that Adam and Eve are to serve humanity as the prototype of all marriages going forward. They, we find out from God, have been placed into an amazing one flesh union, and they are to remain together for the remainder of their earthly lives. So as we think even about this brief description that we're given here in Genesis concerning the accretion count, what do we learn about Adam specifically, because that's who Paul is bringing up in our text. What do we learn about him from this biblical description? We learn that Adam is the first human created by God, and that his creation comes by the direct actions of God. We learn that it was to Adam first, when he was still the only human being living on the face of the earth, that God gave a prohibition of eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and that God pronounced a certain judgment of death upon him if he chooses to disobey. We learn that while Eve is just as much human as Adam, and just as much created in the image of God as Adam, that she was created differently. And we learn that she was actually formed from a part of Adam's body and that God then brought her unto Adam to serve alongside of Adam as his completer. And we learn that they were to serve as the prototype of all future human marriage relationships. They were given a commandment by God to be fruitful and multiply. In other words, that God had created them and expected them to be the parents of all future humanity. This truth regarding God's creation of mankind, and especially Adam, is foundational, we will find, and fundamental to everything that our text wants to unfold for us, not only today, but in the coming weeks. So with that in mind, let's go back to that first statement I said this text brings us to, to have to bear with, and that is the literal uh, reality of a man named Adam. The Bible would cause us each to have to come to a conclusion about this. God either created a literal man whom we call Adam or he did not. This man, Adam's creation, function, and purpose are either just as the scriptures declare them to be, or they are not. We either have been granted by God a truthful declaration concerning humanity's creation and existence, or we have not. But if we answer we have not or we're not sure, then we must be honest enough to admit that we will never have any possibility of ever understanding how it is that we got here or what we are supposed to do. And dear friends, can I just say this morning, that's the problem with fallen man. We have a world filled with people who are trying to make sense of something they cannot understand. And they cannot understand it because they reject fundamentally what God said is true concerning their existence here. They refuse to believe that God created humanity starting with one particular man and then one particular woman. And that he gave to these, this first couple these responsibilities. And because they refuse to believe this, they, they, they now try to make sense of a, of a life 
not even for us to take into consideration this morning the, the bearing of sin and all that's done to this world. But even if that hadn't happened, I think they would struggle if they are unwilling to believe God and accept his truth. They would say, this world doesn't make sense. Life doesn't make sense. And we can never hope to make sense of it if they reject the statement that God's given them. Because nobody can know where it began because nobody was there. Either God has told us honestly what happened or nobody is ever going to know. All right? Now, as Bible believers, we better accept what God said, or what are we doing here? And I'm assuming most of us this morning do accept the biblical commandment, but if you don't, what are you doing here? I've seen some foolish people in my lifetime, but why would you waste your time being a part of a church or sitting in a church service when you do not accept the fundamental declarations that God has given us concerning our very existence? Either Adam is real, and all that we just read is true, or it's all fake and it's a lie. If it's a fake and a lie, we might as well all go home. But for our purposes today, why is this understanding of a man called Adam so important? We could look at it this way. The Bible elsewhere speaks to the reality of a literal man named Adam. We just read some in the creation account. And there are other passages in Scripture that reference this man. Why would the Apostle Paul, why would he in a letter he's writing to the Roman church about salvation... Why would he reach back into Genesis and pull out the, this description of this man and bring the attention of the Roman believers to this particular man? The reason we'll see is because this man, Adam, serves as a federal head of all of humanity. Now, if that's a new term to you, what do we mean by that? Federal headship. What is federal headship? In short, we could say it this way. Federal headship describes the relationship in which an individual represents a larger group and in which the actions of that representative are then imputed onto the larger group. We learn from our text today that Adam served as the federal head of all humanity with respect to the concepts of sin and righteousness. I think we could probably say he served as a federal head in more ways than that, but Paul is really only concerned about these two. He's going to bring our attention in what he writes here to the concept of Adam being the federal head of man with relation to sin and righteousness. In other words, when God created Adam, and when he placed him in the Garden of Eden, just as we read back in Genesis a few moments ago, and when he forbade Adam from partaking of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil upon pain of death, that Adam's decision with regard to God's commandment was going to impact every subsequent human being that came upon this earth following him. And this is exactly what Paul says happened. Let's go back to our text in Romans 5, if you're there. Let's read verses 12 again and read on with the rest of our text verses. Wherefore, Paul says, as by one man, Adam, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men for that all have sinned, for until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. How do we know that Adam was the federal head of humanity with regard to sin and righteousness? Well, because we are told sin entered into this world through Adam. And because we are told, death entered into this world through the sin of Adam. And because we are told that death has passed upon all mankind because all of sin. Now, let's stop there for a moment. You might say, okay, I, I get you. I, I follow the logic here in the first two statements. But what about that third statement? You said because of all of sin. And we might say, Paul writes that death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. Isn't the Bible simply stating that death passed upon all men themselves because they have sinned? That death is here because of the actions that they have done, the, the sinful actions they have committed. And in answer to that question this morning, I would answer it with both a yes and a no. I would answer yes in this sense, all men have sinned. And by that, I mean all men have personally and volitionally sinned. There is not a human being who has ever lived upon this planet, save Jesus Christ, who is not a personal and volitional sinner themselves. But I would also have to say no in the sense that Paul is not speaking about each man's personal volitional sin when he makes this statement. Paul is speaking of man's sinning in Adam when he makes this statement. 
say, okay, pastor, I get what you're saying, but how would we know this? How do we know that's what Paul means? Well, we know that because of what he writes in verses 13 and 14. I mentioned this last week when we gave our overview, that when you look at verse 12 in our King James Bibles, it's, they use a parenthesis. I think in some of the other English translations, rather than a parenthesis, they, they give a, 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 a dash mark to set this section apart. But verse 12 makes a statement, and we even read this th it this way last Sunday. Then you have a parenthesis beginning in verse 13, and that parenthesis in our, in our English Bibles runs all the way through verse 17, with our verse 18 then apparently picking up his initial thoughts. So Paul makes a statement of verse 12. He decides to digress a little bit and give more explanation or a fuller understanding of what he just said in these intervening verses. And then he comes back to his original thought in verse 18 and finishes up through the rest of the fifth chapter. All right. So we have this parenthesis. What does the parenthesis teach us? Well, it does a couple things. First, Paul informs us that sin is not imputed when there is no law. Okay, that's what he says in verse 13. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. What does Paul mean when he makes this statement? And why is it important to the argument he's trying to make here in Romans chapter 5? Let me just say this. I think we can know that Paul doesn't mean by saying this that the absence of law means an absence of sin. Paul has already informed us in his basic statement that death is the result of sin. And Paul is going to go on and state in verse 14 that everybody from the time of Adam till the time of Moses, and in that sense he's using Moses as the lawgiver, the entrance of the law into the world, everyone from that time frame has died themselves. Therefore, Paul himself is going to inform us when he makes this statement, he isn't saying an absence of law means an absence of sin. I think what Paul is meaning by this fact is that if there is no law, no clearly articulated and defined code of conduct, we could call it God's righteous expectations for mankind, then man's disobedience is not charged against him as a specific violation. And the reason why it's not charged against him as a specific violation is because there has been no specific law that he has violated. Okay? If this interests you more, I'd have to get you the date, but we dealt with this a year and a half, a year ago, maybe a year and a half ago. Because a question was submitted in one of our question services in the afternoon about this very question. Is there sin without law? And I spent a lot of time trying to develop that further. And I'll, if you're interested, come and see me. I'll get you the date. You can find it online. You can listen to it because we go into more detail in that area. I don't really want to get hung up on that concept this morning, hashing out the difference between sins outside of law and sins within the law. Because I don't think they're really crucial to what Paul is, is trying to say here. I think Paul has brought this up because he wants the Roman Christians to understand something about the federal headship of Adam here. He wants them, and he wants us, obviously, to understand that all men have sinned, even if they themselves have not violated one of God's righteous commandments. In other words, Paul has basically already stated the whole world's sinned because they're all dying. But he says, God doesn't really impute that sin to people who haven't violated a law in that sense. I said, why, Paul, were you confusing us? What do you really mean? And how does Paul know that men are still sinners even if they haven't violated the law? That's what he says in verse 14. He says, nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that is to come. Paul says what? He says, we know that all people have sinned, whether they personally violated one of God's laws or not, because they all die. All people from the time of Adam until the time of Moses died. You say, wait a minute, Pastor, Enoch didn't die. All right, granted, Enoch didn't die. All right, he was translated God. So this is a unique experience that God translated him to his presence. We don't really need to deal with that. This is not in any way violating what, God is, what Paul is teaching here. The reality is all people except for this one person that God has specific purpose for outside of the, the scope of what we're talking about this morning. All of humanity has died from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, the lawgiver. And we know that all people from the time of Moses till present have died. In other words, from the time of Moses till now, they've all died. Except, no, pastor, Elijah didn't die. Okay, granted, there was a specific purpose that God had for Elijah, and he did not die like the rest of us have. All right, I'll give you that, but that still doesn't violate Paul's teaching here. Other than Enoch and Elijah, any Enoch or Elijah people here present? Okay, no, so it doesn't apply to us. Everybody else has died concerning Paul's argument here. And why have all of these people died? Paul's answer is sin. 
They've all died because of sin. But you can say, okay, I get it. We're sinners. We deserve to die. The wages of sin is death. I know I'm a sinner. Most of us here this morning, unless we're just bold-faced liars, which is a sin itself, before God we would say, yes, guilty. I am a sinner. Therefore, I know I will die. I deserve to die because of this. But isn't it interesting? Paul says, that's not what I'm talking about here. Because he says in verse 14, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression. Who does Paul have in mind when he says, death has even come to these who have not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression? Well, to be fair, it is possible that Paul has in mind those people who lived from the time of Adam unto Moses. And whether it's those that had no written law to transgress yet died. That may be who he means. Or Paul may have in mind individuals who never personally sinned yet still who died. Whoa, wait a minute. What people could there possibly be who did not personally die? Well, I think if we think through it, then Paul would have to be speaking of groups of people, and maybe for our best illustration this morning would be people such as infants who can and do die, even though at their stage of development they are incapable of ever having committed a personal sin against God. This could be the tragedy of death of an infant, even in the case we could think of this, you could say, well, maybe, but once a baby's born, we see kind of that sin nature rising up in their selfishness. I grant you that, but what about the babies who die in the womb? What about a miscarriage? What about an abortion? Or even the death of a child before they were actually old enough to personally contemplate what they're doing and committing a volitional sin against God, Paul says, his point in verse 14 is what? Even those individuals die. And why do they die? Well, in the context, the only logical answer is sin. Sin is the reason why they die. The wages of sin is death. But if individuals such as these that Paul has in mind in verse 14 are dying because of sin, when or how? Did they sin? And Paul's point, his whole logic, his whole reasoning is here, they sinned in Adam. Paul is informing us that when Adam sinned by eating the forbidden fruit, that all future humanity sinned in him. Every human being has sinned because every human being is in Adam who did sin. Now, we don't have time really to move forward. I hate kind of leaving it here. We don't have time to move forward. Because I'm sure there are some people here this morning who maybe hear that statement. If this is the first time this has ever been, been you know, delivered to you and you've ever really stopped to think about this, you might find yourself distressed. You might find yourself wondering this morning, wait a minute, I thought God was a God of fairness and I thought God was a God of justice. How could God treat people as sinners based upon the sin of another individual. How can God declare that I'm a sinner if I never sinned? How could God do that and still be just? And we're going to discuss the answers to this more fully in the future sermons that come out in this text. But this morning as we close, I want to just bring out real quickly two things that we need to be considering when those thoughts perhaps enter in our mind. And we'll develop them more over the coming weeks, but I want us to have them in our minds now. I don't want to leave us without these thoughts, at least to... to for you to go home and meditate on before we come back for the, the coming weeks. I would say this, how is it that God has been good, has been gracious, has been just in dealing with us through the federal headship of the first human being named Adam? I would give you two reasons why I think we should be very grateful God has chosen to do this. The first one is this, Adam gave mankind the best chance at living righteously. Adam gave mankind the best chance at living righteously. Think about it. Adam was created by God himself. God, I don't know, maybe this is a, maybe in, in the description of the, of the Genesis account, we should see, you know, one of those Christophanies. Maybe we should see one of those physical appearances of Jesus on earth prior to his is it incarnation? I don't know. I don't know what it took for God to form 
Adam's body out of the dust of the earth. Maybe Jesus himself literally with hands sculpted his body out of the dust of the earth. I don't know. The Bible doesn't give us that kind of insight, but we are led to believe that it was God himself who physically created this man, Adam. All right? We all can say we're fearlessly and wondrously made by God. That's true. But none of us are made like Adam was made. We are made through the natural processes that God designed into his creation, which is miraculous and marvelous in and of itself. But none of us were made like Adam. Adam was physically sculpted by God himself. And Adam was created in righteousness, holiness, and innocence. Adam is the human being that God himself, when he created him, created him in perfection, created him in total righteousness, created him in total holiness, and put him into this utopian environment. And that's the third concept. He was placed in this environment with no inward or outward pressures placed upon him to disobey. You might say, well, wait a minute, Satan was there. Well, we'll discuss that maybe in a later sermon. He does exist. But we would have to admit, Adam's environment is nothing like ours. Every one of us was born into a fallen and cursed world. We think this world is normal. This world is not normal, biblically speaking. It is nothing like what God created. Everything that we have ever experienced in our entire life has been tainted with sin. Such was not the case with Adam. Adam was placed into the perfect creation where sin did not exist in that environment in which he was placed. So he was placed in this situation. So when you think about it in light of what we're discussing this morning, if any human being stood a chance of succeeding in righteousness, it was Adam. And we should be willing to admit this. If Adam, given all of the privileges he was afforded by God, chose to sin, then certainly every one of us would have sinned. If you were so proud and arrogant this morning to think, well, if I had been in Adam's place, things would have been different. Don't fool yourself. Because you're even having those thoughts through your sin affected mind and heart. So we should be thankful that God chose to deal with this this way because Adam gave us the very best chance at living acceptably before God because he had an experience none of us will ever be afforded in that sense. But secondly, I would say this. This is the most important point, and this is the one Paul's going to develop over the coming weeks. We should be thankful that God has chosen to deal with us through Adam's federal headship because in the end of verse 14, he writes this, those who have not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is, speaking of Adam, Adam, who is the figure of him that was come? What is Paul's point? His point is this, Adam's federal headship is setting the stage for Jesus's federal headship. So in other words, we're going to learn this over the next coming weeks. What was lost in Adam's sin as our federal head has the potential of being regained through Jesus' righteousness, who also serves as our federal head. And this is the entire point of this section. Paul is setting the stage to inform us how it is possible that we could be declared righteous before God because we are in Christ. But the only way that this could be possible, the only way that we could be declared righteous with God because we are in Christ is because God has chosen to deal with man through federal headship. Yes, first and foremost through the federal headship of Adam. So when Adam disobeyed in sin, we all were cursed in Adam in that sense. We all fell under the consequence of that sin. We all die because we were in Adam. Yes, that's the negative. But that negative held the potential for the positive, which is Jesus Christ. Which means now because Jesus didn't sin, Jesus as the second Adam was perfect righteousness, was perfect holiness, did do complete obedience. That as a federal head now, anybody who finds themselves in Christ has afforded all of the benefits, all of the blessings, all of the righteousness of Jesus Christ to their account. Just as right now in our, our creative state, we have all of the sinfulness and the disobedience and the judgment that was found in Adam's sin upon us. Because God chose to deal with us in Adam as a federal head, 
opens up an opportunity for God also to deal with us through Jesus as a federal head. We need to close this morning. We don't have time to develop it further. I wish we could because that's the amazing part of this whole text, and we'll get into it in the coming weeks, and that's the blessing of it all. But let me just end this morning's message with a question I asked you last week as we gave this overview, and we were talking about the concept of being in Christ. Are you in him this morning? Because this is key and critical, right? Even if what we discussed this morning, we realize this. Humanity is in one of two distinct groups. You are either in Adam or you're in Christ. There's no other options. And if you're in Adam, you're going to die. I don't just mean you're going to physically die, and, but you have other hopes. No, you're dead. You're separated from God if you're in Adam because Adam was separated from God because of his sin. And if we're in him, we're separated from him as well. When Adam sinned, he died. We know in this sense, when the death is spoken of, there is the spiritual death because Adam didn't keel over physically and die right away. But he did die at that moment that he partook of the fruit. What happened? He was separated from God. And if we're in Adam, we're separated from God. So you're either in Adam or you're in Christ. And if you're in Christ this morning, then all that Christ is and all that Christ affords us is ours. And then when God looks on us, he looks upon us through the lens of Christ, his son, which enables us to be acceptable in his sight and to receive all the benefits and the blessings afforded to us through him. So I wonder this morning, are you in Christ? If you are, praise God. If you aren't, you can be. Because the amazing thing about being in Christ, and Paul's already developed this at great length in this, this study of Romans already. You get in Christ by faith, by simply receiving what Christ has died to provide. And this morning, if you are not in Christ, you can be by simply receiving him as your hope of eternal salvation. And all the benefits of his federal headship will become yours. Father, this morning, I pray you challenge us with these thoughts. Lord, as we think through these processes in our own minds, we realize why Paul would bring this up. In some ways, this is a truth that could happen and man would never even know about it. But we know about it because it's been written here. And it's been written in a letter that's being written to Christians primarily, explaining the reality of their salvation. So Paul says, this is something Christians should understand. This is something Christians should know. They should understand how it is that they were in sin and how it is that they could possibly be in a state of righteousness and grace through Christ. Paul wants to understand it comes through this element of the federal righteousness. Father, my prayer this morning would be that your spirit would take this truth and apply it in each of our lives as only he can and should. And I don't know where each person in this room finds themselves this morning with relationship to these truths. But Father, my prayer would be if there are those in this auditorium who presently, if they were to have to honestly give an account of whose federal headship they find themselves in, they would have to honestly say they're in Adam. My prayer this morning is that your spirit would help them to see the perilous position they find themselves in and the certainty of eternal separation from you if this is where they remain. Well, Father, my prayer would be that you would help them to see, even though we haven't dealt with that in depth yet, help them to see the reality of Christ and what he has accomplished and how they can be in Christ and be afforded everything that he has accomplished for them as a federal head. Lord, may this be the day that they would receive him by faith. Father, thank you for your truth. Use it as you see fit in our lives, we pray. Thank you and ask these things.